So the deep question I want to tackle today that will uncover this point is given all of the advantages of controlling your own digital press, why do so many creatives rely on Twitter to communicate with their audience? I'm Cal Newport, and this is Deep Questions, the show about living and working deeply in an increasingly distracted world. I'm here at my Deep Work HQ, joined, as always, by my producer, Jesse. Jesse, I found a way to, uh, against all the promises I've made to our listeners, to work baseball (laughs) back into the show. (laughs) Opening day next week. Opening day next week. We will be uh, podcasting live from Nats Park. No, we're not. We should, though. We could uh, podcast live from the bullpen. It's still my... Yeah, that's right. You have the connection there. It's still my dream that Mike Rizzo, at some point, is going to get connected to this general manager of the Nationals to this podcast and say, what we need is like Cal to come talk to our front office. And I just come in there, talk about World Without Email, talk about deep work. Next season, World Series. (laughs) And there they are, the trophies being handed out. And I'm, I'm sort of on the field, you know, but I'm not up there on the dais. And, and Rizzo just gives me the finger point and I just give him like the thumbs up. And it's like a real emotional. And he's sort of acknowledging that the front office's embrace of deep work and non-context switching collaboration pro- processes was really kind of at the foundation of their next World Series run. <laughs> I think it's a reasonable dream. But anyways, what I wanted to, what I wanted to show you, I'm working baseball in here subtly. Um, I want to show you something that the Washington Post did in their coverage of a spring training game, a national spring training uh, spring training game from earlier this last week, actually. So if this is airing on Monday, it was early last week. Uh, the Nationals were playing the Yankees with actually most of the Yankees lined up minus Aaron Judge and well, Mackenzie Gore pitched six innings, two hits, pretty good. But here's what I wanted to talk about. So I have this up on the screen now. So for those who are watching at youtube.com slash calendar media this is episode 241 you can also find this at thedeeplife.com so here's the washington post is up on the screen what they did was they switched to a live blog format to cover the game now what they would normally do up until this point this is considered an experiment up until this point coverage of the games as they unfolded happened on twitter so the two beat reporters, Jesse Doherty and Andrew Golden, would just tweet throughout the game to give their updates about what's going on or what they've what they've heard. And they were experimenting this time with, well, why don't we live blog it? That's what's on the screen now. So you can see Jesse, uh, Jesse Doherty, not producer Jesse, having various length updates on this page at the Washington Post about what's happening, some of them longer than others. So they were considering this to be an experiment. So here's the thing. It makes so much sense to cover your games this way as compared to on Twitter. Here are the advantages. It's a nicer format. Tweets are short and you have to do tweet threads with these one out of N where you have multiple different threads that go together. It's uh, cumbersome, unrelated tweets intersperse between the tweets you're doing about the game. Uh, It's not a great visual or reading format on a live blog, they can spend as much time as they want. So I have up here one post is a few paragraphs too long for a particular tweet. All of the uh, live blog updates just appear all on the same page, one after another, formatted nicely, no distraction. Doing it this way also creates new permanent content for your site. So this now is an article, right? With a strong start from McKinsey Gore, Nationals Top Yankees at Spring Training, where you have some summary at the top and all the live blog below. So this actually becomes a permanent piece of content that actually has quite a bit of information in it. So you get new content for your site. Uh, You also control the eyeballs, right? When Jesse Doherty is tweeting about the game on Twitter, the Washington Post does not control the eyeballs of people who are keeping up with these game updates. Twitter controls the eyeballs. Twitter can show them its own ads. Twitter can push them towards other tweet threads. When you're on the Washington Post, Now we can show you other content related to the Nationals. Now we can show you our own ads. Now we have the ability to funnel you towards subscription or towards email 
newsletter products. I mean, it just makes so much more sense for a company that produces content for a living to have full control over the eyeballs that's reading their content. And perhaps most importantly, for the reporters like Jesse Doherty to be able to do this work on your own site and not on Twitter saves you from the anxiety distraction machine that is Twitter. Because when you are on there and I'm posted on Twitter, you're getting the reactions, you're getting the weirdness, you're feeling the pressure to comment on other things that are going on. You get obsessed with, well, is this thing spreading? How many people are reading this? I see a lot of baseball reporters in particular. This is a microcosm of the broader issue that Twitter creates for journalists getting obsessed about being first on various types of scoops. And and can I get John Heyman to to quote tweet me and say I was first on it. And there's all these weird incentives in it. And none of this work is actually directly helping your home publication build up an audience or build up eyeballs. I want to tackle today that will uncover this point is given all of the advantages of controlling your own digital press, why do so many creatives rely on Twitter to communicate with their audience? Now, I want to dive deep into this question today because I think in answering this question, we're going to find out that the incentives that are drawing us to these platform monopolies like Twitter are actually not as strong as we think so we can get an intimation of a more healthy relationship with the digital world. Uh, after we do that deep dive on this question, I have a collection of questions from you, my listeners, that all orbit around this general issue of grappling with social media and its role in you being a creative professional and how important it actually is. Uh, and then we will switch gears at the end to do something interesting. All right, so that's our goal. So let's dive deeper on this question. Why are people, especially creatives, using Twitter? The obvious answer is going to be virality. There's this idea that Twitter has this virality engine because of their retweet mechanism. It is possible for things you write, if it catches the attention properly of the cybernetic curation organism, which is the combination of individual people making retweet decisions, plus the fact that the follower graph is, has power law expansion, the cybernetic curation algorithm has the capability of spreading your tweet to a massive audience all at once, perhaps even unexpectedly. So their sense is, I want to harness this potential virality to very quickly grow a large audience. This large audience is then something I can monetize or it will give me a lot of influence. That's the promise of Twitter. Its virality can build you an audience much faster than any other method. But is this supposed benefit of Twitter worth giving up all of the other advantages of controlling your own platform, the type of advantages we talked about with the Washington Post examples? I want to give four reasons why I think the answer to that question is no. Four reasons why I think the supposed benefits of Twitter virality are not as strong as many creative professionals who rely on that platform actually believe. So here's my first reason. Most people don't end up building a Twitter audience of any notable size. The average creative professional who is tweeting never builds up a big follower account, but you do not need a big follower account to reap the full negative impact of being on Twitter. So you reap that full negativity of the distraction and the anxiety of even without a lot of followers, if you say the wrong thing, that could spread. So you have negative virality that hangs over your head. Uh, then there's also the, the addictive distraction of what's catching on, what's not. Am I getting retweets? When we had the comedian Jamie Kilstein on the show, he really talked about that from the perspective of a comedian, this experience of you're obsessively checking after you tweet to see if someone famous retweeted it. So you have all of those negatives even if your audience is small, and most people have small audiences. So this idea that Twitter is going to spread your genius to the world and build you this audience, it's actually very rare. The second reason why I think this virality explanation is not so strong is that Twitter followers are much less valuable than an organically acquired follower. So let's compare a Twitter follower to, let's say, someone who is interacting with you on your own site or through your own podcast who say subscribes to your podcast or signs up for your email newsletter because they have over time come to really trust you or appreciate you and your point of view that organic follower is significantly more valuable than each digit that clicks up on your twitter follower account twitter followers are not that powerful 
Writers have known this for a long time. Twitter followers do not convert well, for example, to book sales. And I think this is a great natural experiment because how else to, how else is better to test the loyalty of a follower than actually asking them to invest $15 on your behalf? Book authors know this. Email newsletter subscribers, they will buy books. You can get up to a 10% even plus conversion rate on number of subscribers in your email list because those are organically acquired followers who over time grew to trust you. Twitter followers convert at a minute skill rate. You can have hundreds of thousands of Twitter followers. And when you start tweeting about your new book coming out, it might generate minuscule, relatively speaking, sales. Whereas a 10,000 person mailing list can actually make a dent in getting your book noted. So even if you can build up this large Twitter follower count, it doesn't actually mean that you have a powerful audience. A 30,000 person mailing list, I would argue, is as useful as a high six figure, maybe even million Twitter follower count on Twitter. So even if you do get the followers due to virality, it's not necessarily that valuable. The third objection I wanna bring up here is that when you look at specific examples of people who have grown large Twitter followings, typically the forces that drove that audience growth were not internal to Twitter. External exposure, external fame is what actually brought them to the attention of a lot of people. And people came to follow them on Twitter because that's where they happen to be producing. So it's not that Twitter virality is for a lot of people how they got discovered. It's that Twitter is where the people who discovered them elsewhere came to follow them because that's where they happen to be. Let me make this more concrete with a specific example. I think Conan O'Brien is a great example here. So after Conan O'Brien took the Tonight Show, was uh, fired from the Tonight Show, sort of was in the wilderness, one of the things he started doing was tweeting. And he did one tweet every day. And there's this document, there's a good documentary about this called Conan O'Brien Can't Stop. And for a while, the conventional wisdom was, this is what got Conan relevant again. He was interacting with people directly without TV and doing these funny tweets and people were retweeting and following him and it kept him on everyone's mind and it kept him relevant, right? So it's sort of a case study of, of Twitter being this great creative platform. But here's the thing, Conan realized what was valuable here was his pre-existing fame, his pre-existing talent as a comedy writer and on-screen comedic presence, and his massive national exposure that he's had on TV and on radio, and he's on Stern all the time and on uh, going on other people's shows. I mean, he's an incredibly well-exposed person. So yes, when he went and said, I'm going to put my attention into tweeting every day, people went over there and said, well, follow your tweets. But it wasn't that Twitter built him his audience. He had a big audience. He just said, this is where I'm going to hang out. So they came over there. Now, speaking of our last point that Twitter followers are not that valuable, Conan eventually figured out having my audience follow me to Twitter is not useful to me. I can't do much with Twitter followers. So he stopped the tweeting every day and instead put his energy into making his own home online, a home he owned, which was his podcast. And now again, his pre-existing fame and talent and massive exposure, which is what's generating all this attention that could now aim this attention to a home he owned, which was his podcast. Now, what's the difference in value between these two things? Well, tweeting every day on Twitter got him a couple million followers and maybe it helped some ticket sales when he was touring or maybe not. The bringing that attention to his podcast, they signed a, I don't, I, I don't know the whole magnitude of it, but it was tens of millions of dollars deal for his production company. So taking this pre-existing fame and aiming it towards a platform he owned, forget about the raw number, like how many people download your podcast versus how many Twitter followers you have. No, he turned his pre-existing attention to a platform he owned that was worth tens of millions of dollars. When he put that attention instead towards someone else's platforms, Twitter, maybe he got 20% higher ticket sales when he did live shows. So the reality of many large Twitter audiences is those audiences are there not because Twitter went out and found them, but because the person was already famous and that's where they're hanging out. Barack Obama doesn't have a large Twitter account because he's good at Twitter. It's because he's Barack Obama. All right, the final objection I want to bring up here to the idea that Twitter virality is so critical to any creative professional is that 
Twitter virality is best harnessed on your behalf as opposed to on your bequest. So there's really two broad categories of information going viral on Twitter. One type is that, you know, you actually tweeted something yourself that was smart or funny or outrageous, and it caught the attention of the cybernet curation algorithm and spread really far. That's actually not that valuable. I mean, it can help attract more people to want to follow you, but that does not actually directly translate necessarily to you being more successful at what it is you do. The second type of virality on Twitter is where something is really good. Something has been constructed or done that is very good. A book is excellent. An article is excellent. A movie is excellent. A video game is excellent. And Twitter is spreading the word. This thing is great. You got to see this thing. You got to read this thing. Let's debate about this thing. That type of virality is incredibly valuable for a creative professional because it's not just raw attention. It is attention on you and your skill and what you can produce. It's the type of virality that will allow you to actually grow and cultivate new, loyal, organic audience members. Now, here's the thing. That virality does not require you to be on Twitter. In fact, that virality is actually impeded if you were the person trying to tell people, look at my article, uh, look at my, my movie I made. That's a really bad way to kick off that isn't this great virality. That type of virality is much more effective when it's third party look at this article Cal wrote is going to do much better than me saying, look at this article I wrote. And you see this with creative professionals on Twitter. They have this huge elaborate dance of self-deprecation to try to kick off the second category of virality. And they'll be, they'll say, you know, I'm so blessed to just to have such great editors and just to, to be noticed like this and to have this article out. So they're trying to find a way to make it palatable that they're the ones talking about it. But in the end, actually the best type of virality is people talking about you. So you being on Twitter and having to pay those prices of anxiety and addiction and distraction, at the same time losing out on all the advantages of owning your own platform, controlling the eyeballs, building up your own organic audience, having the nicer format, all of these advantages, to give all of that up to try to create this much weaker form of virality when Twitter can do this on your behalf if you're producing something good, it, the trade-off really doesn't make really doesn't make a lot of sense. All right, so what I'm trying to say here is there's a lot of advantages to releasing content on your own platform. The main reason people do this instead on Twitter is virality, but as those four virality myths I just talked about emphasize, that reason really is not that attractive anymore. So what is the alternative if you're a creative professional who wants to embrace the online world? Create the absolute best stuff you can, released on your own platform, be this a web-based text platform or an audio-based podcast. Build a fiercely loyal audience slowly but steadily. When you get a new member of your audience, it's because they've heard your stuff enough. They love it. They really want to read it. It's not just a Twitter follower. When your work occasionally goes viral on your behalf, which it will if it's good, enjoy the fact that you're now going to capture some more listeners or readers or audience members in your own ecosystem and then get back the producing work too good to be ignored. That I think is the right way to approach content production on the internet, not to get lured by the siren sound of these platform monopolies that basically just chew you up, chew up your attention, chew up your vanity and make you into grist for their attention economy, money-making mill. I think this type of discussion is important for a broader reason as well. Let's move beyond just Twitter and content producers. I think it's really easy when we think about the downsides or the excesses of the internet to get stuck in a hopeless feeling. To get stuck in this hopeless place where you say, well, of course I have to use these platforms, but I'm not liking the way what they're doing and the way they make me feel. So if we can only just have the right laws passed, maybe we can fix this. Or if we can only have the right person buy the platform and, and then they can fix it and make it better. And these type of discussions show there's another alternative. You don't have to be that involved with these platforms in the first place. You can be cutting edge online, growing your audience in 21st century ways without having to worry about what's happening with Twitter, what's happening on Instagram. Is TikTok is going to be banned or not? I just hope we're moving past this age where we feel like platform monopolies are somehow a critical piece of being a creative professional. And if you somehow avoid those, you're in trouble. You're not. Those advantages are overblown. It's okay to move on. So there you go. I didn't know that Conan O'Brien had such a big audience. Yeah. So that's what 
I mean, the tweeting every day was supposedly how he sort of re-engaged, you know, re-found relevance and regained his audience. But my argument is like, actually, that didn't lead to much. What was important is when he started the podcast. Right. Because then he had an actual thing he was creating that was very high quality and the audience he attracted there was actually valuable. I don't know what the size, maybe you could look it up. Look up uh, Team Coco, C-O-C-O podcast deal. So he has a couple other podcasts it produces, but Conan O'Brien Needs a Friend is the main podcast. And I know they just bought a big building in Los Angeles. So there was some deal. One of the networks has like a... The headline says $150 million deal. So this is the question. Verge. Yeah. So Conan O'Brien's fame aimed at something he owns generated $150 million. His fame instead generate, aimed at Twitter generated a lot of likes and maybe, you know, slightly more attention when he was trying to sell tickets. I think Sirius XM bought it. And I think we can so just that explains why he's on um, Stern. But he's all but that's true. But he's been he went on Stern a lot. Okay. Like in that period right after he left the Tonight Show, he was on he goes on Stern a lot. So the I think he, I think he's done that for a long time. Um, but you can just scale that down. Okay, so most people are not as famous as Conan O'Brien, so you can scale it down. But the key thing is there's this that difference. So like let's say your notoriety is a, a tenth of Conan O'Brien's, but like whatever, you're still out there. You're 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 known, you're on like some big podcast a lot, you had some big books or something. You could just scale down those numbers. So like Twitter will give you, you mm -hmm. know, an extra hundred people showing up at a show, only putting that attention towards the thing you own, to scale it down by a factor of 10 is maybe worth, you know, $1.5 million a year in revenue. It's, it's aiming, audiences come from, you earn audiences by doing things notably. Twitter, this idea that, I mean, there are some viral influencers, but it's a dark Faustian world. You don't want to be, a, a your whole world is just being viral on Twitter. No one really wants that. Mm -hmm. so these audiences are coming from other things you're doing. So why take all that juice and basically give it to Twitter in, in exchange for peanuts? All right, so I want to do some questions that all roughly orbit this topic. Before we do, first, let me mention one of the, the sponsors that makes this show possible. And that is our friends at Cozy Earth. Cozy Earth bedding is made using only the finest premium viscosi, V-I-S-C-O-S-E, from highly sustainable bamboo. Top designers choose Cozy Earth. It's been named to Oprah's favorite things five years in a row. But I want to give you my, my individual pitch for this. These sheets are very good. And let me tell you why they're very... Let me tell you the evidence that we actually feel they're very good. Cozy Earth sent me a free pair of these sheets. And we enjoyed them so much, we bought more. We bought more of these sheets from them because we actually don't want to have any other sheets on the bed. And if we if they get out of rotation, my wife and I are very upset. Uh, we've even bought their PJs because we love the sheet material so much. We love this idea that if we don't have their sheets on the bed a given week, you can wear PJs that have that material. It really is really comfortable. So this is an actual endorsement right here. Uh, I have used my discount code on multiple occasions to order more of Cozy Earth. It really does make a big difference. I've never been a sheet guy uh, until Cozy Earth became one of our sponsors. You emailed me for it recently. Yeah, I was like, when are we going to get a Cozy? This is true. I asked Jesse, I was like, when are we doing a Cozy Earth read? Because we're obsessed with these things. And you needed to order more. <laughs> oh, I, yeah. I said, I, I had Jesse look up the discount code. Uh, they're great sheets. They're great sheets. So, I mean, here's their wording. Whether it's luxury sheets, loungewear, pajamas, or new bath towel collections, you'll love shopping at Cody Earth and Cozy Earth. And now you can order your, their bedding in five awesome uh, colors. Cozy Earth bedding comes in a beautiful, reusable canvas bag. Yeah, those look very nice. The main, the main endorsement, though, is like it's the only sheets that Cal Newport uses. And I don't know if that's compelling to people, but it is true. So save up the 35% now on Cozy Earth. Hurry, this offer in soon. So go to Cozy Earth, C-O-Z-Y, Earth.com. And be sure to enter the promo code DEEP at checkout to save up to 35%. That's CozyEarth.com, promo code DEEP. Use that promo code. Trust me, you want the get the 35% off. Uh, I just used it myself recently. All right, speaking of sponsors that I also use, I want to talk about our friends at ZocDoc. ZocDoc is the only free app that lets you find and book doctors who are patient-reviewed, take your insurance, and are available when you need them to treat almost any condition under the sun. Jesse, I want you to, I'm taking out my phone here. I want you to be uh, the arbiter for our audience. You got to confirm this. I'm showing Jesse now a text message on my phone from a 
11 a.m. today, so from 30 minutes ago. So what what do you see on this text message here from my dentist? What is the URL? ZocDoc, baby. There we go. <laughs> nice. Just 30 minutes ago, I have a, a encounter with ZocDoc. My dentist uses ZocDoc. My primary care doctor uses ZocDoc, uh, and I love it. So it's a, an app you can use, first of all, to find doctors who are near your area, take your insurance, see reviews from real people. Once you sign up for a doctor, if they use ZocDoc, they handle your paperwork through there. You can do the paperwork in advance. They do uh, reminders about your appointment. You can confirm what's going on. Uh, you don't have to sit there with a the clipboard and fill out all the same information every time. It just makes a lot of sense. Why just randomly look up a local doctor on Google or ask a friend using ZocDoc makes it more uh, consistent. The other thing we like about ZocDoc is we like saying the name ZocDoc.com. So sometimes Jesse and I joke about other products that could have an even longer uh, sequence of those rhymes. Well, I want to briefly read a submission along these lines from Elliot. So here is Elliot doing his, uh, his attempt to get an even better URL than ZocDoc.com. All right, so here's Elliot's ad. World War II generals are unanimous. Keep your feet dry. Our product protects your most important piece of clothing from all forms of damp, and it secures it with a unique code known only to you. Set up your enclosed series of taps on the outside of the box to lock it for your access. Head to knockknocksocklockbox.com for more information. So, Elliot, well done with that parody, but the real URL you need to know is ZocDoc dot com slash deep so go to zocdoc.com slash deep and download the zocdoc app for free then find and book a top rated doctor today many are available within 24 hours that's zocdoc.com slash deep zocdoc.com slash deep all of our ads today jesse are feels like people that are deeply products that are deeply integrated in my life at the moment that's good yeah what we need is a a, a pull and spring sponsorship Jesse keeps me, my seltzer water addiction, well served with our Poland spring. Uh, let's do some questions. What do we got? All right. Sounds good. First question from Will, a 55 year old economist. What do you think about Twitter's decision to put the number of views on tweets? I hate this change. It adds an extra layer of stress before you can get that dopamine hit or like or reply. Well, Will, I wrote something about this dynamic in my book digital minimalism where i was talking about facebook and, and this is a very important technological moment that explains a lot about our current relationship to social media especially the more compulsive use and, and the way the story unfolds with facebook is that engineers at facebook last decade wanted to put the like button into the facebook product for a very pragmatic sort of nerd optimization reason. They were seeing that under a lot of Facebook posts, many of the comments were very similar and low information. There's a lot of like great exclamation points, good, congratulations. And you had to scroll through all of these low information, single word exclamatory comments to get to the interesting comments where people were actually adding information. So the engineer said, let's just add a like button. This way, if all you want to do is like, yeah, great, I love it. You can just click that and there'll be a count of how many people liked it. And then we won't have comments clogging it up. So the actual comments on the post would be more informative. It's an engineering thing. They saw an inefficiency. They wanted to fix it. It turned out, however, as an unintentional side effect of adding that like button to the uh, Facebook platform, engagement time went up. And what was going on is that this like button Though this was not its original intent, this like button was adding in an intermittently reinforcing indicator of attention. You could now, after you posted something on Facebook, go back and check, are there likes? How many likes? And then you can come back and check an hour later. Has it jumped up or is it really, uh, is it really plateaued? And different posts would generate different likes. There is a slot machine aspect to it that maybe something about this post would break out to a wider spread and you might have a massive jump of likes on the post. And this was very exciting. And you never knew if that was going to happen. We are wired to love that type of reinforcement. We are going to pull that virtual slot machine lever again and again and again. So once Facebook stumbled into this innovation, other platforms did the same thing. So Instagram, which at the time had not yet been bought by Facebook, they came next. Uh, and this became integrated into many other platforms. 
It was an accidental mechanism of moderate behavioral addiction. These type of stories, by the way, they fall into the wayside because I, I think a lot of the media narrative on social media right now is from journalists who are obsessed with social media that just want it to be more focused on what they like and fixing it. They want to fix it, but they don't want to fix the issue of using all the time. They don't want to fix the use of, the issue of being addicted to it. Uh, they just want to make sure that there's not bad things on it. Or if you're on the right, you want to make sure that people aren't being kicked off. But but we've lost track of this original thread of just not wanting to be on these things so much in the first place. And these type of addictive intermittent reinforcement mechanisms is a big driver of that engagement. So back to your question, Will. By adding a view count to Twitter, you're adding a more highly dynamic, highly salient intermittent reinforcement indicator. Replies are a little bit slower on Twitter. Uh, retweets happen, but again, not that often for most posts. So this is a, a, an engagement issue for Twitter. Most people, most tweets, they don't have a big audience, get no replies and very few retweets. By putting in the views, though, you have a finer grain number that can rack up higher, even for relatively small accounts. Now you have a more salient feedback mechanism. You're going to get people who are minor Twitter users and producers to come back and check more often to see what's going on. There's other reasons that I've been given for why the view feature was added. But I think this is one of the key implicit reasons why you want to add these type of feedback into it. One of the reasons why TikTok is so successful, by the way, is they just go straight for the jugular on these mechanisms, right? So the, the likes on Facebook, the favorites on Instagram, the views on Twitter is still driven by actual humans and actual human interest. It, it, it gives you intermittent uh, reinforcement because some stuff you post is better than others. TikTok doesn't really trust people. I mean, we already see this with their recommendation algorithm. They say, I don't need someone to favorite something. I don't need someone to spread something. I don't even need someone to tell me who their friends are. Our algorithm will just tell you what you should look at. Well, they do the same thing with views. So TikTok will artificially make your view counts go up and down specifically to create the slot machine effect of you never know which year TikToks might take off. And because everything is just algorithmically recommended, there's no human in the loop, TikTok can do this with incredible precision. They, their algorithm can basically say, you know, Jesse hasn't had a TikTok get a lot of attention in a while. We're worried that, you know, people are going to stop watching Jesse's TikToks. So let's just take one of his TikToks and we can just show it to 10,000 people. And now his view count on that jumps to 10,000. Now, Jesse is like, you know, I was going to quit TikTok, but this last thing I did got 10,000 views. Like maybe I'm on the cusp of emerging as a TikTok influencer. And so they just cynically and uh, cynically directly manipulate your attention with the exact same precision as someone putting in win rate tables to a Las Vegas style slot machine. That's part of the reason why they're so popular. If you don't believe this, talk to any young person who uses TikTok. I overhear these conversations on a regular basis and they will talk about their one big hit or their two big hits. That's all you need. That's all you need to use it all the time. You know, I had this one thing and it got a hundred thousand views. You know, I bet if I just tweak things a little bit, you know, Jesse's thinking like if my dance moves were a little bit sharper, uh, I'm going to get that more regularly. And so it's, it's, they're just cynical about it. So anyways, it's, it's a good question. No, I don't like any of those features, but again, the answer to all this stuff is guys get off these platforms, get off these platforms, do the, whatever your equivalent is of the Washington Post live blogging instead of live tweeting baseball games. I heard a conversation at Bevco, Jesse, the other day, where it's like, a, I think it was a date. Young people, first date. You were in line or you were sitting at a table? Sitting at a table. Okay. It's trying to write. Um, and it was a, two young people and they're on a date. And he was getting, ser he was seriously getting points by talking about his one viral TikTok. <laughs> He's like, yeah, it was a, uh, you know, like it was a you know, complicated hat on and all the young person stuff. He's like, yeah, I got, a, you got like a million views on that. And she was impressed. Like he was definitely sort of peacocking his TikTok numbers, but you know how effective that is? Like that guy is going to TikTok now constantly. I mean, think about this feedback. He's like, man, sometimes things go big and it's like impressing the ladies and and like, I don't know why that guy over there is sighing so loudly all the time. I wonder what's wrong with them, but <laughs> I don't know to be like depressed or intrigued or, I mean, my main issue was I was trying to write 
and they were right next to me. And when you're on a date, you're talking all the time. And I was kind of frustrated by that. But anyway, that's really funny. That yeah, that's was what getting, they were talking about. He was getting mad cred. Well, because, and also, oh man. So the dynamic of this conversation, she opened it by being like, you know, one of my TikToks got, I forgot the number was, but 5,000 views. And you could see he was dusting off his glove, like ready to throw his fastball. I was like, well, you know, I had one that got a million views. <laughs> oh, it's so good. Yeah. So TikTok knows what it's doing. All right, let's do it. What do we got next year? All right, next question is from Adam, a 43-year-old furniture maker. I find it sad that along with tweens, teens, and average adults, some of our world's thought and business leaders are similarly more concerned with playing in the attention economy than focusing on a deep life. I mean, I agree with you, Adam. There is a sort of vanity run amok thing going on here, crossed with a insidious addictiveness. Multiple people I've talked to, for example, who personally know Elon Musk are baffled by the way that Twitter just took over his life. It makes no sense for him and what he's working on in his companies and his goals in life for him to spend so much time on Twitter is some weird combination of addiction fueled vanity. Now, I think there's a, there's a, a key point to make here that distinguishes Twitter from other platforms. So most of these platforms do play in part. One of the many things they play on to win in the attention economy game, one of the many things they play on is personal vanity. Twitter does it in a different way than the other platforms. So in deep work, I, again, I, I looked at Facebook and I said, Facebook in circa 2014 and 15, when I was writing deep work, had a collectivist attention model. So back then Facebook was still pretty heavily driven by, uh, friends. You know, I post things on my friends' walls. They will check me. They'll post thing on my uh, post things on my walls. And I argued that, look, Facebook was in part a response to the hostile attention landscape of the web. So early web 2.0 allowed almost anyone to post information online. You could have a blog uh, where you could just post whatever you wanted to post, but it was a hostile attention regime because let's be honest, most things that most people have to say is boring and it was rough. You would start a blog, you'd put things on there and no one would read it because it was just your random stuff and no one cared. I had my very first blog I started in college. It was called Inspiring Moniker. Zero readers. Because why would people care? So that was a very hostile uh, attention environment and people said, why am I just going to keep putting stuff out there. And that's actually like a completely reasonable reaction. It's like, yeah, like most people actually shouldn't just be putting stuff out there, but people who really have, you know, something to say, it's like a young Ezra Klein doing his political blog where he was posting nine times a day in 2004. Like there's people who emerged, they took advantage, they, they had something to say, they were skilled, they did the work and it was a great, but for most people it's like, yeah, this, you know, you don't have anything interesting to say. Facebook said, no, no, I have something for you. Attention collectivism. You will have these friends. These will be people, you know, you will befriend them digitally. They will befriend you digitally. And the agreement will be, I will pay attention to whatever junk you put up there. If you pay attention to whatever junk I put up here, I'll put up some random photo. You'll say, ah, oh, so cute. And you'll post some thought about something. And I'll be, I'll come over and say, ah, you got it. Right. And we'll just give each other attention. It's nice to feel it. You know, it's nice to get attention. Most people don't get attention. And in most parts of their life, like people aren't paying positive attention to them. So it monetized in some sense, this desire to have people pay attention to us. It reacted to the, the hostile attention landscape of just the bare bones web 2.0 and said, no, no, we'll just all agree to talk to people we know and, and pat each other on the back. And I thought this was a little bit shallow, but whatever, it worked pretty well. Twitter is doing something different here. It's offering sort of a similar dynamic, but for actual, what I would think of as higher tier thinkers uh, and leaders, right? So it, it actually is, its model is not focused on anyone will post something and other people will come and comment on it. It's actually brutal like that. It's brutal like web 2.0 for the average average user. If, if I tweet something, nothing happens. People don't come and like it because they know you. That's just not the dynamics of how Twitter works. It, it spreads virality. It doesn't connect people to their friends anymore. But if you have some sort of actual expertise, if you're a journalist, if you're a creative of some type, if you're a politician of some type, Twitter is offering you much more access to attention that you, than you could get before through traditional media channels because they were just way more narrow and way less numerous. 
And so Twitter is playing on the attention vanity, not of the average user, but of the above average user. And that's their whole business model. So if you're a professor with some expertise, you're drawn, you're saying, man, I could, I could wait until I get citations on a paper or I could go on Twitter and I have something to say here. If I have anything to say, no one cares. My tweets will just go and disappear, but I actually have something to say. If I make the right takes, I could get on a day-to-day -day basis, this retweet and share and like and reply attention. Every once in a while, someone really famous might retweet my thing and I feel like I'm a part of this. And so Twitter says, we're gonna play on the attention vanity of above average users. And by doing that, they attracted a lot of above average users, people who actually were unusually creative or had a specific expertises to share. That is the whole core of what makes Twitter a compelling place for everyone else just to sit and read what's going on because you have interesting people spending all their time writing on there. And so we talked about before earlier in the episode is one of the things that attracts content producers is oh, I want to build an audience virality. This is the other thing that attracts, especially these sort of no notable personalities. They're attracted. It's, it's attention and vanity. And it's really good at that. And I think it was a really smart move by Twitter to say, Forget making the average user feel like people care about them. What we need to get is the unusually clever comedian. We need to get, when there's a pandemic, a bunch of credentialed virologists. What we need to get is, you know, contrarian political thinkers who have a funny streak. Like we need these type of people who actually have some talent to not focus that talent into articles and books and occasional TV appearances and lectures put it into our platform. So by focusing on the attention vanity of above average users, they created a constantly refreshed pool of above average quality information that then the cybernetic curation algorithm could play with. And now as the average user, you're seeing all these things going by that is uh, very engaging and very compelling. It's why Twitter clones have not done nearly as well, even though the algorithmic and digital architecture is the same than in the same pool of people. So Twitter did very well there. So anyways, Adam, I think that's what's going on is, is Twitter very consciously said, we need to make above average users feel like they're getting more attention than they could otherwise get. And then we're going to get a lot of above average content pushed into our system. And that's different than almost any other platform. Most other platforms, they play more on your own personal attention vanity, people you know, paying attention to what you do. I mean, that's not completely true. Instagram has some Twitter vibes to it, but it also has some Facebook vibes to it. TikTok really doesn't lean heavily into we need above average users. It's just we need a giant pool of content and we'll use algorithms to figure out what's going to just press your reptilian brain buttons and make you keep looking. Twitter is doing this almost uniquely. And so part of what makes it so sticky. All right. This is great. A lot of a lot of Twitter bashing and discussion. Yeah. That wasn't Twitter bashing. I'm just that's just actually explaining. Yeah. This is why Twitter is effective. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not just, you know put it on my Twitter is bad hat. I mean, th there's a reason why this is an effective platform. All right. What do we got next? All right. Next question is from Bo, a 38 year old teacher. I'm not big on social media, but as an independent researcher in the humanities, I use academia.edu and ResearchGate mainly to get access to papers. I also have a Twitter and a LinkedIn account mainly to share my blog posts and see if I can find an audience. Is this the right balance? All right. There's a good case study of our discussion from the deep dive earlier in the show. So not knowing too much about specifically what type of research you do or your career, let's just give some random recommendations here. Paying for access to academic articles is a no brainer. If you are an academic who's not associated with an institution that gives you that access. So of course, Twitter, I don't think you need to be there. We just talked about this. Twitter gives you this illusion that it's going to grant you a virality that will grow your audience bigger than if you hadn't had Twitter, I would say, forget it. Just produce really good work. Twitter may work on your behalf. People may share your work on there and you need to have a platform you own to capture that attention. But putting your attention in the content production on Twitter is going to open you up to all these negatives and dilute the positives you get from your own platform. LinkedIn, I, I guess it just depends what you're doing on it. So for LinkedIn to be effective, A, you have to ignore the sort of increasing social features slash streaming distraction features and just focus on the core original ability to use it to look at tertiary network connections. I mean, the, the value of LinkedIn, the unique value proposition of LinkedIn is I can look at people who are in the network of people I know. 
So not secondary, but tertiary connections. And that's really useful, right? So you say, okay, I need uh, a connection to the movie industry. I don't know anyone in the movie industry, but I probably know someone who knows someone in the movie industry. That person can make a, a recommendation on my behalf. And so it opens up contacts. And because you have an intermediary who knows both ends of this link, that's actually a high quality contact. If you go out one more layer, it doesn't work anymore. So if it's, I know someone who knows someone who knows someone in the movie industry, that connection doesn't work because there's no person in common between you and the ultimate person you want to talk to. So remember my, my longtime friend, Ben Kasnoka, who used to be Reed Hoffman's chief of staff. I remember him at the time when LinkedIn was really taking off, uh, explaining this network theory to me. It's, it's all about this sweet spot of your friend's friends is the sweet spot of opening yourself up to a huge amount of, of, of uh, potential connections while still having the ability to make those connections strong. So if your work is such that as an independent researcher, you need contracts or engagements with clients in various types of industries, and you need connections to people in those industries, that aspect of LinkedIn could be very valuable. So I would summarize this, I guess, as saying, uh, yes to paying money to gain access to articles, no to Twitter, maybe yes to LinkedIn if you really need it. Now, there's a bigger point here that I made in a, a New York Times op-ed that came out in 2016, and it actually generated a lot of furor at the time. But I, I wrote this New York Times op-ed where I said, we overestimate the value of social media presence in getting noticed and succeeding in your career. And I say, we are forgetting the fact that these platforms are very new. And most industries have been around for a very long time. Twitter was not used at a high rate until 2012 to 2014. So when I was writing that up, I was like, this is a few years ago. Before that, all these industries still existed. People still got noticed, got hired, grew reputations, grew really big careers. And they did this all without Twitter followers. And they did this all without being an influencer on Instagram. So presumably these bespoke methods by which your work is noticed and rewarded still exist in most fields that have been around for more than just a handful of years. So don't ignore those. In fact, if you ignore those and say, I'm going to invent my own way to get noticed and succeed in my field based on social media, you're taking a huge risk. You need to pay less attention to your Twitter followers and say, in my particular field, I'm this independent researcher in humanities who makes my money this way. Uh, how do people traditionally get noticed and succeed? Almost all of those channels are still there. Social media's rise, which is only still just a decade old at this point of any sort of widespread adoption, has not gotten rid of existing channels of getting noticed and succeeding. And so I keep coming back to that with people. What, how do people traditionally get noticed and succeed in your field? And usually it involves producing really good stuff and it's really hard. And it has nothing to do with virality or having large follower accounts. And it's almost always that's going to be the answer. And so until you have a really good answer to that question, forget about like new tools are going to somehow give you a shortcut. Now, when I wrote that op-ed in 2016, that caused a lot of problems. This was right before the mainstream had turned against social media. So the, the political right in America had turned against social media at this point because they were worried about being censored. But the political center and left in America was still very laudatory towards social media at this point when that came out. And so me standing up and saying, social media is not as important as you think for your career. You should maybe ignore that and focus on the fundamentals. It was considered a heretical, almost certifiable thing to say. It really upset people. Uh, it was, whoa, whoa, no, no, no. Social media is the key. It's how you get noticed. It's how you circumvent all of these gatekeepers. It's how you build up movements. I mean, there was so much, uh, Pushback really, really surprised me. And I've talked about this on the show before, but the New York Times commissioned the next week a response op-ed. They got the social media manager of monster.com, Patrick someone, Patrick Gilroy, to write a response op-ed to mine and say, this is crazy. Don't listen to this. Uh, a lot of articles were written in response to mine. This is crazy. Don't listen to this. I had hostile radio interviews. We're like, how, how can you believe this? Now I understand this mechanism because we see it all the time in 2022, 2023, we see this all the time. Where is the fiercest pushback generated 
this sort of when you get these type of big pylons generated. It's not when someone comes from left field from the completely other team and throws some rocks. You're used to that. It's when someone who you feel like is in or close to your tribe pushes a little bit to the edge. Then it's seen a little bit more like heresy and that has to be policed. So if, you know, in 2016, Jaron Lanier stands up and says, social media is nonsense. People are like, yeah, that's Jaron Lanier. I mean, he's like kind of crazy and brilliant. And this is what he's been saying for a long time. And we know it. it's not a big deal. But if a computer scientist comes out and says that someone who is in sort of mainstream thought, someone who has some influence with an audience, someone who's sort of a part of that sort of mainstream centrist or left of center tribe comes out and says, I don't think that's that important. You have to fiercely uh, at the time, you had to fiercely police that to prevent the Overton window from shifting away from the direction you wanted the ship. So it was a, it was an interesting example of what became much more prevalent in the years that followed, this sort of policing of views. And it, this became a cre- increasingly political after a while. So the left and the right would do this on political hot topics. But this was less political, but it was just more, there was this mainstream intellectual thought that social media was this uh, powerful force that toppled dictators and helped Barack Obama get elected. And it was very meaningful, important. And so if you're involved in this sort of mainstream intellectual life, they did not like someone starting to veer off the reservation. Now everyone's like, of course, you know, everyone agrees with it now, but it was interesting. So it was like an early mild pylon, but it showed a general internet dynamic that I think has really strengthened ever since then. So you wrote that before the like button got introduced, right? Like now the like button actually got introduced earlier. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the like button got introduced like 2007 or eight or something like that. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. 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 I mean, the interesting thing was when I wrote that, it was right. So the turning point in the mainstream intellectual thought on social media was Donald Trump getting elected. And that's ultimately what turned it is the shift from Facebook helping Barack Obama to Facebook helping Trump shifted, I think, the reception of social media and it, it opened up like a lot more skepticism and hostility towards the platform from the center and left. The, the, the hostility from the right was already there. Mm-hmm. I started hearing that like 2015. So that was already there. Uh, but from the center and the left, that was after the Trump election. But it wasn't immediate because that op-ed, that op-ed came out the in the Sunday, in the New York Times, in the Week in Review, the Sunday after Donald Trump was elected. Mm. So it wasn't an immediate response. It, I mean, it was a, a weekend review section that was uh, that and like a bunch of political stuff. And then the next week they had the follow-up, right? So in the first, the last months of 2016, early months of 2017, there still was a general positive consensus on social media. It mm-hmm. wasn't really till the Cambridge Analytica and the Russian disinformation stories when those really took off, which was more two thousand after Trump was in office in 2017. That's when you began to see the shift. So I know it's an interesting time point. So, so really the shift towards universal negativity towards social media was probably first or second quarter of 2017. Mm-hmm. Um, if not all the way around it, you had to get all the way to like 2018 really before yeah. People are on board. But then by the time I was promoting digital minimalism in 2019, the pushback I was getting from reporters is like, why aren't you pushing for even harder, you know, regulations and shutting down these companies? So, I mean, yeah. man, that thing flipped. That thing flipped hard. All right. Let's, uh, we have time. Let's do one more question here. All right. Next question is from Alta, a 22 year old software engineer. Do federated social media networks such as Mastodon stand a chance against centralized ones such as Twitter? We don't, we don't need Mastodon. I mean, I'm fine for Mastodon to exist, but the part of the premise of Mastodon is we want Twitter, but just without stuff we don't like. I mean, it's the, it's the same interface as Twitter. It's the same paradigm of Twitter, these short tweets that go to people who uh, follow you. And my bigger argument is this Twitter format is not that fundamental. I mean, we have websites, we have blogs, we have WordPress, we have podcast. We have the ability to independently produce and post video and host it and have it be watched on all these devices. We have all of these other means of producing content independently without it having to live in a massive ecosystem where we don't control it anymore. So we don't actually need a Twitter clone. That's fine if like there is a Twitter clone if Mastodon takes off, but we don't need it to. And I think we, we, we became so myopic 
in recent years because we got so used to the dominance of these platform monopolies that our vision of what the internet mean means became confined to it means Instagram and it means Twitter. The internet was a lot more than that. So getting away from these platform monopolies, it's not just, let's just have Twitter, but not have it be owned by one person. It's, we don't need a Twitter clone at all. We, we are already developing independent alternatives to this that are way more successful than the Mastodon. That's why I mentioned podcasting. That's why I mentioned individual WordPress. I think email newsletters, all of these are examples of independently produced media content being produced where you control much more of the eyeballs, you control your audience. And this is all working a lot better. Mastodon's not working that well because, you know, Twitter turns out that, why does that format work? It works if you have a massive retweet network that can be very good at virally spreading information in the cybernetic curation paradigm that we've been talking about. And you have a really huge amount of above average users constantly pumping information to be evaluated by the cybernet curation algorithm. That's what makes Twitter interesting. Not that you can post short things and see it on a timeline. And so this is why a Mastodon federated server doesn't really do so well. It's because you don't have that massive network that does the really effective curation. You don't have all of the best comedians and thinkers and politicians, and outrageous people, all these people putting all this attention into it to generate really good content. So you end up with 70 guys on a Mastodon server saying boring things, and then they get bored and just ban each other. <laughs> so we have alternatives to the platform monopolies, but they don't look like the platforms. And I think that's actually, I think that's actually good. All right. Well, what I want to do is uh, move on now to our something interesting segment. Before I get there, however, let me briefly mention another sponsor that makes this podcast possible. Another product that I use every single day, and that is our friends at Henson Shaving. So I've talked about this product before. Henson produces a beautifully constructed, precision engineered aluminum razor. Henson's main business is manufacturing precision aerospace parts. They have these giant CNC router machines that can do incredibly accurate metal shaping. And so they built this beautiful, very sturdy metal razor that when you put just a 10 cent safety blade in there and, and screw it in, it gives you just a teeny bit of the blade peeking out on either side. I have the actual measurement here. Point. 0013 inches is all that sticks out past the edge of the razor. So that allows you to get a shave without the diving board effect you get if the blade sticks out too far. Without the diving board effect, you get a close shave without the nicks, without it getting caught. So you, you pay more upfront for this beautiful metal razor, but then you pay very little for the blades you put in there. So it doesn't take long before it is cheaper to be using a Henson's razor than it is to use a subscription service or to buy them at the drugstore because you're only spending 10 cents per blade once you have the really nice, beautifully manufactured piece of equipment. So I like tools that are made really well. I like tools that over time are cheaper to operate. So I shave with my Henson razor. So it's time to say no to subscriptions and expensive drugstore purchases and instead say yes to a razor that will last you a lifetime. Visit hensonshaving.com slash cal to pick the razor for you and use code CAL and you'll get two years worth of blades free with your razor. Just make sure you add that two year supply of blades to your cart. And then when you type in the promo code CAL, the price will drop to zero. That's 100 free blades when you head to H-E-N-S-O-N-S-H-A-V-I-N-G.com slash CAL and use that code CAL. We also want to talk about our friends at Mint Mobile. If saving more and spending less is one of your top goals for 2023, why are you still paying insane amounts of money every month for your phone bill? Switching to Mint Mobile is the easiest way to save this year. As the first company to sell premium wireless service online only, Mint Mobile lets you order from home and save a ton with phone plans starting at just $15 a month. I actually was talking about Mint Mobile. I put it in a, a talk I was invited to give at my kids' schools about smartphones and kids. And one of the things that comes up in this conversation is how do we give our kids the ability to text message us without having to give them a fully featured smartphone? Mint Mobile is actually one of the things I talk about in this lecture I'm giving because it makes it really easy. You can go onto Amazon, buy a feature phone, so a, a flip phone that can still do text messages, but not the internet. You buy it for whatever, 70 bucks. And then you just get one of these $15 a month 
fully featured wireless plans for Mint Mobile. You do it online, they send you a SIM card, you stick it in your phone, and now for a very small price, your kids have the ability to text you to pick you up from practice or to say they got on the bus safely or whatever. This is what I like about this. It makes it cheap and easy to get texting, to get calls, uh, to get data. So you have a lot more flexibility. You can have multiple plans. You can have multiple phones. So anyways, to get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get that plan shipped right to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash deep. That's mintmobile.com slash deep. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash deep. And that's mint, M-I-N-T. I'm thinking, Jesse, about, you know, I wrote this whole talk for my kid's school, but I'm thinking, hey, I put a lot of work in these slides. Maybe we'll record a version of the talk right here in the studio. Yeah. We'll just put it up on, you know, YouTube for, because people care about this. Uh, what should I do with my kids and smartphones? And I've gone deep into this research and have a lot of thoughts on it. I know some of these researchers who are involved in it. And I have this sort of big slide that goes, all these slides to go through it all. So if that's of interest, let us know. I think I might at some point record a version of that talk and, just put it out there in the world for anyone to see. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, it's an interesting topic. Um, all right, so let's switch to something interesting. This is where we take interesting things that people sent to my interesting at calnewport.com address. And we like to just look at these to end the show on something cool. So I actually have two things I want to mention today. The first thing is a new podcast that just launched. It's a Pushkin Industries podcast that's hosted by podcaster extraordinaire, Justin Richmond. Uh, Justin Richmond is one of these super pros in the industry. He came out, he came up through the NPR system, working on some of their major shows and uh, NPR podcast and came over to Pushkin where he's a producer. He also co-hosted a music podcast on Pushkin with Malcolm Gladwell and uh, Rick Rubin. Anyways, he has a new podcast out called started from the bottom. And I thought it was a really cool idea. So I just wanted to mention it here. So what he does on this show, Justin interviews people with humble origins who managed to scale the summit of success. People who are outsiders, people not part of the old boys network, people who grew up in a world where almost nobody went to college. And he asked, how did they beat the odds? Let's you to hear their stories in their own words. I'm fascinated, as you know, about this topic, about how people succeed in various endeavors. And I think by focusing on people who had very few advantages, you're distilling in some sense, some of the necessary core drives that goes behind success. So it's a really cool show. Uh, some of the early episodes feature people such as Charlemagne, the God, Susie Orman, and the uh, MFA champion, Francis Ngano. You know, I've actually crossed paths with Charlemagne a couple times. Uh, I've been on his radio show, The Breakfast Club, or I think I still hold the record for the widest geekiest person to ever be on that show. But Charlemagne worries a lot about the impact of social media on young people. So that was a cool interview. I also went on his comedy central show. He had a TV show. Uh, I've been a guest on that show as before. Very thoughtful, really interesting guys. Um, Francis and Gano, I don't know, but I just know he's terrifying, a terrifying MFA fighter. So Francis, all I can say is I incredibly respect you. Please don't kill me. Anyways, it sounded like a cool show started from the bottom. You can find that wherever you get your podcast. The other cool thing I wanted to talk about, uh, it's something that's happening in Australia, but I think it's reflecting a more, a broader trend. So I'm going to pull up an article here on the screen. Is this loading okay, Jesse? Yep. All right. This is an article from The Guardian. Um, Labor and Greens senators back four day work week. So I have it on the screen. If you're watching at youtube.com slash calendar media episode 241. So what's happening here is you have Australian senators beginning to back legislation that would uh, make a four day work week at full pay, something like a standard. This topic is coming up a lot in a lot of different places all throughout Europe. For example, similar discussions are happening. And I, I just think the four day work week in general is something to keep an eye on. And it's interesting. I think that Australia is starting to get more serious about this, but something to keep an eye on. My feelings about it are mixed. They're, they're mixed. You know, I just did an interview with a reporter on the four day work week and I was relatively actually negative because I was the mood I was in when I did that interview. But I think mixed is the right way to describe how I'm thinking about it. So 
pros and cons. On the con side, I think it is stepping aside because you don't want to deal with complexity, the real issues. And the real issues is not that people think that there's too many days during the week in which they're going to work. It's the nature of their work itself. And for knowledge workers in particular, it is overload. Overload is creating all these problems. There's a lot of psychic damage that's done by having too much work on your plate. And just saying Friday is no longer officially a work day doesn't get rid of that overload, doesn't get rid of that psychic damage. You end up still working that day anyways. You still are paying that tax of all the overhead of all these all these different tasks on your plate. That means you can spend less time on the actual work itself and it piles up more and all these negative things don't go away by just turning the knob on the number of days in the week that you work. This is different, of course, than the industrial sector where the main knob you had was the number amount of time you work. If I'm putting steering wheels on a car in a Ford plant, the only variable that is going to now affect that experience is just how many hours am I doing that? And so in the early 20th century, when we get something like the Fair Labor Standards Act uh, from the 1930s that put in place the five-day work week, it made a lot of sense. This is the knob we need to turn. What is the reasonable amount of days? In the knowledge sector in the 21st century, it's not the not the issue. The issue so, is not so much how many hours is your workday, it's how much work is on your plate. So that's my, that's my trepidation around the four-day work week is it's kicking the can to the side. It's not actually tackling with what matters. On the other hand, we have an interesting data point that comes from the company Basecamp who switches to a, a four-day work week for part of the year every year. And it's an interesting data point. And what they found is reducing the total number of days, at least temporarily, creates a scarcity mindset that does actually reduce time wasting. It reduces long meetings. People are less likely to call a meeting. People get a little bit more focused on what's important because it creates a sense of scarcity. We don't have as much time. So you know what? Let's not do this. Let's remain more focused. So actually, uh, it created a better working environment. There was a lot of negative feedback when Basecamp first did this experiment. And I document this in, I think this is maybe in deep work. I talk about this or potentially a world without email. There was pushback at first. It said, oh, you're just going to make people take five days of work and squeeze it into four. And the uh, co-founder CEO, Jason Fried responded, that's not what's happening. People are actually reducing their work when there's less days. So it's possible that the four day work week will indirectly improve things. It will be an indirect side effect because of a sense of scarcity. People will actually pull back what they think is a reasonable amount of work to assign. There's also some other obvious benefits such as if Friday is not a work day, even though you still might be answering emails all day and feeling like you have too much to do, it'll become socially acceptable not to have meetings. That's another day without meetings. That's useful. There's a flexibility benefit. Of course, any day you have off in an official sense is a day where you're more flexible to do things like go to the doctor, take your car to the shop, go to your kid's school. So there, there are these sort of smaller direct benefits and perhaps a larger indirect benefit on uh, work. But I still think the conversation we have to have is about the details of the nature of knowledge work. The What makes knowledge work hard? What's burning out knowledge workers today is not as simple as a question as it was a hundred years ago where you had two things to make sure the conditions were safe and the hours were reasonable. Knowledge work is different and we have to introduce more knobs to turn, but it's really hard and we don't want to do it. So we focus on the simple things. So I'm just mixed on this. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. There might be some benefits. There might be some drawbacks, but it's not getting at the heart of what I think is actually causing problems in the knowledge sector today, but it's interesting. So I wanted to show you that article. These links, of course, are in the show notes. You can also find a summary of all the questions and everything else in there. Uh, but let's wrap it up. So thank you, everyone, who sent in your questions. Thank you for listening. We'll be back next week with a new episode of the podcast. And until then, as always, stay deep.